Every year on the 13th of February, the people of Dresden commemorate the destruction of their city by Allied bombers. Like Hiroshima, Dresden has come to epitomize the horrors of modern aerial warfare. But there were many other places that endured a similar fate. There were other German cities that suffered just as much as Dresden did. And I cite Würzburg as an example. Dresden's been pointed out as the pinnacle of the uh, area bombing of the war, but I mean, other targets such as Würzburg were just as comparatively just as badly affected. I believe there were several thousand people killed in it. For most of the war, Allied bombers had spared Würzburg because the town was of little military importance. But on the 16th of March, 1945, more than 80% of Würzburg was destroyed. Almost 5,000 people were killed. There was fire everywhere. People were screaming, throwing themselves into the river to put out the flames and falling from windows like burning torches. I wouldn't wish for anyone to go through what we did. Time watches unearth documents that help explain just why towns like Würzburg were ever bombed. This film casts new light on the final stages of the Allied bombing campaign in World War II. government rejected the bombing of non-military targets as illegal. In 1938, Chamberlain had stated in Parliament that air attacks on civilians were against international law. But this policy was abandoned when the blitz on British cities showed that the Germans had little respect for civilian lives. We will meet out to the Germans the measure and more than the measure they have meted out to us. We will have no truce or parley with you or the grisly gang who work your wicked will. You do your worst and we will do our best. The Germans started it was a phrase on everybody's lips from the Prime Minister downwards. I don't think it's terribly surprising that at a time when the British Army was quite incapable of acting on the ground effectively against Germany, against Hitler's tyranny, that Bomber Command represented the only means by which Britain could strike effectively against the German people and concern for humanitarianism towards the German people was pretty low on British priorities. Look at it. Great extended sidings, oil tanks along a row by this railway line, pipelines coming out of the wood where there are more installations coming down to these barges in the river. And it's very big. It certainly is a peach of a target, isn't it, sir? Concern for civilian lives was further diminished because bombing specific war targets proved difficult. British bombers were highly vulnerable to anti-aircraft guns and Luftwaffe fighters. They had to attack under cover of night. Bomb doors open. Bombs going. This British wartime film suggests that early in the war, bombers were able to hit their targets accurately. But the reality was very different. Bomber Command was just not hitting its targets. There's a variety of figures available, but uh, in the Ruhr and in Germany uh, in particular, bombers were often five and ten miles away. I've got one story of a, a little town 
in Germany that was something like 50 miles away from the target and somebody dropped a few bombs on the town and started some fires and some more bombers came along and thought this must be the target and something like 50 or 60 bombers attacked this little tiny town. These things were happening all through all the time in 1941. Bomber Command, with the devices available at that time, were not able to find not even the right city very often, let alone the railway yards or the war factories or whatever. From airfields like this in Norfolk, Bomber Command flew 50,000 sorties in the first two years of the war, but without having much of an impact on the German war effort. The bombing policy had to be changed. The targets had to be big enough for the bombers to find and hit them. The new policy came to be called area bombing. Instead of individual military or industrial installations, entire cities were to be targeted. On the 14th of February 1942, the Air Ministry issued Directive No. 22 to Bomber Command. The primary object of your operations should now be focused on the morale of the enemy civil population and in particular of the industrial workers. The Chief of the Air Staff, Sir Charles Portal, added, The aiming points are to be the built-up areas not, for instance, the dockyards or aircraft factories. This must be made quite clear if it is not already understood. Press home your attack. If you individually succeed, you will have delivered the most devastating blow against the very vitals of the enemy. Let him have it right on the chin. Shortly after the directive was issued, Bomber Command got a new commander, Sir Arthur Harris. Air Marshal Harris has this to say. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. He was the man that reinvigorated Bomber Command because it was a command that was in desperate trouble. And here you have, in early 1942, a new policy and you've got a new commander that believes completely in this policy and the two are going to go together very well and in a way they dominate the history of Bomber Command from then to the end of the war. Harris and the area bombing directives that he received. Harris believed that a concentrated area bombing campaign against industrial cities could render the planned Allied invasion of France unnecessary. In December 43, he declared that his bomber force could bring about the collapse of Germany by April 44. Yet by the end of March, there was no sign of a German surrender. Civilian morale was nowhere near breaking point, and Hitler's war machine was far from crippled. German armament production continued to rise until mid-1944. Meanwhile, Bomber Command was suffering heavy losses culminating on the night of the 30th of March, 44, when Harris sent a force of 800 bombers to Nuremberg, an important industrial town and a symbol of Nazi power. When they all saw where the target was, there was this terrible gasp and a, a few expletives, and everybody was pulling on their cigarettes much harder then because they knew that it was going to be a long trip, probably seven and a half or eight hours right into southern Germany and out again. And uh, the route was very close to the Ruhr, where there were a lot of German defences, there were night fighters, anti-aircraft guns, and we knew that it was going to be a pretty grim target. But you didn't talk about fear, you just sort of kept it to yourself, but we were all absolutely terrified, knowing that a lot of us wouldn't come back that night. Not only was the route to Nuremberg very long, but the latest weather forecast had also warned that for most of the trip, the bombers would have no cloud cover. 
Nonetheless, the operation went ahead. The first Luftwaffe fighters appeared just before the Belgian border. The British bombers were an easy target. We saw these explosions going on fairly close to us. The aeroplanes were actually catching the fire in the air and they were flying, some of them were flying along for probably three or four minutes before they'd actually explode. And this was quite devastating because they were really sort of show, showing everybody else up. They, you were being sort of silhouetted by the flames. And we thought that was quite dangerous. The German night fighters had a new weapon that most British bomber crews were not aware of, upward firing guns. With the normal guns, I had to attack from behind. And that was dangerous because the bombers had a rear gunner and getting into his field of fire could be pretty tough. But with the upward firing guns, I attacked from below, often from as close as 50 meters. With the upward firing guns, the risk for us was very much reduced. And this was a crucial factor for the success of the night fighters. Several times, possibly three or four times, a twin-engine German fighter would appear below us like that. He was down there. And at first we said, well, he can't hit us from there. Why worry? And they thought, no, we don't like that. So every time that happened, we moved off and wouldn't let them form eight on us, which is possibly one of the reasons I'm sitting here today. Many other British airmen were not to be as lucky as Harry Evans. The bomber must have discovered me because it banked sharply to the left and made evasive maneuvers. And this made it impossible for me to shoot between the engines. I hit the belly of the plane and it exploded over me. It probably still had its entire bomb load on board. There were huge flames and it practically blew up in our faces. The wreckage was flying all around us. In one single night, 545 RAF airmen were killed, more than in the entire Battle of Britain. Nearly a hundred planes were lost. The target of the raid, Nuremberg, was only lightly damaged. The Nuremberg raid marked a turning point. Area bombing had failed to defeat Germany. Over the following months, the focus of British bombing efforts would shift. Uncle Sam and Britannia, John Bull and Liberty were the leading figures at the recent fraternization get-together dance at Winchester. There are quite a few Americans in Britain now who may have noticed. Uh, shows like this combined ops dance are just one way of cementing Anglo-American relations over here. The failure of the British bombing offensive in the winter of 1943-44 was all the more disappointing for Bomber Command because by this time their American allies were beginning to make an impact. The US Army Air Forces had joined the strategic bombing campaign back in the summer of 1942. They had come committed to precision bombing in daylight. British said, you won't be able to do this. You know, we basically tried daylight raids and it was a disaster. And you're going to have the same sorts of difficulties. And the Americans said, oh no, we won't. We're, we're Americans and we have this sort of gung-ho spirit. We'll find a way to make this work. Initially, the British warnings proved right. The American bombers could not defend themselves against the German day fighters. But 
By the end of 1943, the Americans had come up with a solution to their problem. They bring long-range escorts into the theater in large numbers, and they use those airplanes to escort the bombers. And in fact, what those planes do is to draw German fighters up into the sky. They fight big dogfights, and what you have at the end of 43 into 44, are big battles of attrition taking place in the skies over Germany. By March 1944, the Allies were gaining air superiority. This was crucial for Operation Overlord, the invasion of German-occupied Europe. In the run-up to D-Day, Allied bombers attacked targets in France whose destruction could aid the invasion. And now, not only the Americans, but also the British demonstrated they could bomb with surprising accuracy. The navigational and bomb aiming technology had improved greatly. Harris's force was now able to hit specific targets, such as the French transportation network. Harris had bitterly resisted the transfer of his aircraft from bombing Germany's cities to destroying the French transport network, which the Allied ground commanders considered essential to prevent the Germans reinforcing on D-Day. Harrison said his aircraft didn't have the technical capability to do this effectively. And yet, in the event, they proved enormously successful that the rail links across France were overwhelmingly destroyed by bombing by the Americans and Bomber Command. And this subsequently proved a great embarrassment to Harris because in arguments when, uh, again, precision targets were being asked for by the Supreme Command, uh, Harris could no longer convincingly say that his crews couldn't carry them out. The liberation of France and Belgium after D-Day made life much easier for the airmen. The Luftwaffe lost its early warning system, and Allied advances on the ground increased the range of electronic navigation systems. In October, Allied bomber losses were down to less than 1%. And the Germans faced another problem. They were running out of fuel. Between March and September, German fuel production and imports fell by 70%, from about 1 million to just 300,000 tons per month. Intercepted German signal traffic led the Allied Joint Intelligence Committee to conclude, an increasing paralysis of the German war machine is taking place. The German fuel shortage was the direct consequence of a concentrated Allied bombing campaign against oil targets. But just when the oil offensive seemed to be having a decisive effect, Harris sought to shift the emphasis back from selective bombing to his old policy of area bombing. In October and November 1944, Harris's force dropped more than 60% of their bomb tonnage on German cities. Arthur Harris has been bombing cities now for a couple of years. He's convinced that he could do it. He's resentful of the fact that there was a long diversion because of Normandy. Because of Overlord, he wants desperately to get back and prove that he was right all along. So he has an enormous personal investment in this. During the autumn and winter months, the weather often left no alternative to area bombing. Selective targeting required clear weather. Bombing through cloud relying on electronic instruments was not accurate enough to hit specific targets. But Harris's superior at the Air Ministry, Sir Charles Portal, suspected that Bomber Command could do more on oil targets if only its commander wanted to. 
In a series of letters, he urged Harris to put all possible efforts into eliminating the major enemy oil plants. I believe that the task is within the capability of the strategic bomber forces if they put their hearts into it. If they do, strategic bombing will go down to history as a decisive factor in winning this war. Portal is essentially telling Harris, look, here's all this evidence and we know we're making headway. We just need to press on and do this. And Harris resists it. He just resists it. He says, you know, I'm, I'm following your directive. I am going to oil targets every single night or every single time that I have a chance to do so. Every single time the weather supports it, I am going to an oil, oil target. But then he adds this corollary, which is, but I don't think I ought to be doing that anyway. I don't think that that's the most effective way to win the war. And so naturally, that sets up a suspicion in Portal's mind that Harris's desire to do city bombing colors his tactical choices. That because he wants to bomb cities, he tends to interpret the weather reports in a way that would incline him to attack cities. The argument went on into the new year. Harris finally threatened to resign. Portal decided to give in. We must wait until after the end of the war before we can know for certain who was right. Yet it was not only Portal who gave in. Harris compromised too. In December 44 and January 45, he increased Bomber Command's efforts on oil and transport to almost 50% of bombs dropped, compared to only 20% in October and November. At this point, the Prime Minister intervened, and area bombing was to reach a new level of destructiveness. The German Ardennes offensive in December 1944 had slowed down the advance of the Allied armies in the West. It showed that Hitler's army was still able to fight back. A German surrender was not in sight, and no one could tell how many more Allied soldiers would have to die before the Nazis were finally defeated. At the same time, the Red Army was preparing for its final assault on the Eastern Front. A Joint Intelligence Committee report of the 21st of January, prepared for the Prime Minister alone, predicted that if the Red Army broke the German defences in the East, Nazi Germany might collapse by mid-April. But if the Germans managed to stem the Soviet advance, they might hold out until November. Churchill thought that the strategic bombers could support the Soviet advance. He asked his air minister, Sir Archibald Sinclair, whether Berlin, and no doubt other large cities in East Germany, should not now be considered especially attractive targets. Churchill wants to impress upon Stalin that we have been a good partner, that we've been doing our bit, that we've been fighting the war against Germany, that we have in fact utilized our bombers in ways that have helped on the Eastern Front uh, and have eroded the German war economy. And so Churchill supports and enthusiastically supports attacks on cities that will help drive that point home to Stalin. And there's another motive and that is to impress Stalin with the power of the Anglo-American air forces. At the Yalta conference, Stalin gave his approval to these British plans. But Harris had already independently been instructed to carry out area raids on cities in East Germany, including Dresden. The aim was to add to the confusion caused by refugees in these cities, and thus hamper troop reinforcements to the Eastern Front. If responsibility has to be allocated for the attack on Dresden. It is shared between 
um, Churchill, who was firmly um, urging that attack, and the um, Anglo-American chiefs of staff. They were all involved. Harris knew about it, wasn't in fact terribly happy about it, but essentially the responsibility rests with the Allied High Command with Churchill playing a key role. On the 13th and 14th of February, both the British and the Americans bombed the city of Dresden. The raid on Dresden showed the destructive power the bombers now possessed. The bombing was so concentrated that it caused a fierce firestorm. At least 30,000 people lost their lives, many of them refugees trying to flee from the advancing Russians. For the Allied governments, Dresden created a public relations problem. The neutral press exaggerated the number of dead in Dresden, and the American news agency AP reported that Allied air bosses had made the long-awaited decision to adopt deliberate terror bombing of civilians. The American Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, was forced to tell a press conference our policy never has been to inflict terror bombing on civilian populations. Our efforts still are confined to the attack of enemy military objectives. But the carefully guarded image of American precision bombing was deceptive. When cloud cover prevented visual bombing and forced the Americans to bomb on radar, half of their bombs missed the aiming point by more than two miles. We were doing uh, area bombing too, through cloud and, and, and bad weather. And I, uh, I wanted to make that perfectly clear. That, that we had no reason to be. Uh, you know, morally pure, or pretend to be morally pure. The Americans were bombing their precision targets by radar through cloud, and they were achieving no more um, accuracy, no greater precision results than the British. So the British simply said, all this stuff about um, precision bombing is a load of American claptrap to keep a load of humanitarians happy in Washington. Basically, we're all engaged in the same thing, which is to continue to bring fire and slaughter on the cities of Germany until the last Nazi has laid down his arms. Only a few days after the Dresden raid, the Americans launched Operation Clarion, an attack on local transport centers across Germany, mostly small rural towns that had not been attacked before. One such place was Ellingen, a small town in Bavaria with 1,500 inhabitants, many of them farmers. On the 23rd of February 1945, two squadrons of the 457th Bomb Group attacked Ellingen. Their actual target had been the marshalling yards of Bamberg, a town 70 miles to the north, but bad weather prevented this raid. When uh, the air commander got the information that the primary target of Bamberg was uh, not visible, there was 10 tenth cloud cover, then he directed me as a lead navigator and a bombardier to select uh, a target of opportunity. In this particular case, we flew south west from Bamberg. Well, we picked out Allingen as a town because we could see a railroad running to the town. We could see a marshalling yard. 
or a, a small, at least there's a railroad, and there was also Audubons running through the town. And uh, so the air commander said, well, you pick out uh, a target, and we picked out a target in the middle of Ellingen, and we dropped on it. The railway was in fact half a mile outside the town, and the autobahn running through Ellingen was an ordinary road. It may not have been a uh, first-class road, but it was a road going through the area, uh, and was in, as we had been briefed to bomb uh, transportation, which in this particular case could include a road. Allied bombing policy had reached a point where some American airmen considered a town a legitimate target simply because a road ran through it. 70 tons of bombs were dropped on Ellingen. Friedrich Lutz was seven years old when the bombing killed his mother, his sister and grandmother. He saw their bodies when they were dug out from the rubble three days after the raid. My mother had been scalped by the explosion. Her scalp was pulled back over her head. My sister had her thighs crushed, but not too badly so that I felt she could have been saved if she had been dug out sooner. And as for my grandmother, they didn't let me see her. I suspect she was so badly mutilated that they wanted to spare me the sight. It was horrible. It was really horrible. The military objective of Operation Clarion, the destruction of German lines of communication, was only partially achieved. But a briefing note by the American Air Force General Frederick Anderson to his press officer reveals that the operation also had other purposes. It should be pointed out that such an operation was not expected in itself to shorten the war. However, it is expected that the fact that Germany was struck all over will be passed on from father to son, thence to grandson, that a deterrent for the initiation of future wars will definitely result. If you think about it, Britain, France, Russia, the United States have, for the entire first half of the, of the 20th century, either been fighting war with Germany or worrying about Germany. And they want to put a stop to that. They want to, I think, finally impress upon everyone in Germany, the government, the people, that you can't do this again. You know, this is, we're not going to allow this. And if it takes being brutal to prove this point, then we'll be brutal. Meanwhile, the British continued their renewed area campaign. In March 1945, they dropped more bombs on Germany than in any month previously. 44% of the month's tonnage, that's more than 30,000 tons, fell on cities and towns, towns like Würzburg in southern Germany. Crowned by its Baroque Prince Bishop's Palace, Würzburg was packed with masterworks of European art and architecture. In 1945, it had next to no industry of wartime importance. According to the British Ministry of Economic Warfare, Würzburg contained no priority one target, such as an armament factory or a steelworks, and it had only one priority two target, a power switching station.
On the night of the 16th of March, 226 Lancaster bombers took off for Würzburg. On occasions when we were going over the other side and the flex that coming up, there would be somebody whistling or singing on the, on the intercom. This is a lovely way to spend an evening. Can't think of anything I'd rather do. That was part of the, one of the songs of the day. The raid was assigned to Five Group, a particularly effective precision bombing force in Bomber Command. The five group crews were briefed that Würzburg was an important communication centre. Yet it was clear to them that this was a fire attack on the residential parts of the town. Their bomb loads contained mainly incendiaries. If you attack uh, rail communication targets, etc., you didn't need a lot of incendiaries for that. You'd carry, you would have carried perhaps a 4,000 pounder to blast the buildings apart. But yeah, then you'd carry high explosive bombs, 500 pounders, to blow the rail lines apart and that sort of thing. But with incendiaries, uh, you only set the buildings alight. With Würzburg, I can remember the whole place was a sea of fire. In just 17 minutes, Five Group dropped nearly a thousand tons of bombs on Würzburg. 82% of the town was destroyed, an even greater proportion than in Dresden. The whole town was on fire and time delay bombs were exploding everywhere. And everywhere fear and the screams of the wounded and people burning alive who couldn't save themselves. Dreadful images. It was as if the sky had been torn apart and we were all being swallowed up. There were fires and explosions everywhere. There was no house in the street that was not burning. Everybody was screaming. Everybody was looking for their families. There was chaos on the river Main. It was dreadful, you know. These bombs, they were raining down like tinsel on a Christmas tree. Würzburg was a relatively easy target. It wasn't like going to Essen or Berlin or anywhere like that. We went there, we did what we had to do and apparently took it out and um, another job, job, didn't have to go back there another night. My mother took us by the hand and said, hold on to me, we have to stay together, that's the most important thing. Either we'll all survive or we'll all die. Not every family managed to stay together. When smoke began to fill the air raid shelter, Johanna Bessler escaped to the streets. But her sister Irmgard was too scared to leave. Irmgard wouldn't get out of the shelter. She was so scared and kept screaming. I'm still so little, I'm still so young, I don't want to die yet. So my mother stayed with her. They were both suffocated by the smoke. And it wasn't until six weeks later that I started to cry. It was horrible. It was the worst thing that could happen. A lot of civilians may have got killed. Uh, and um, I can't say it's tough because if they're German civilians, they were there supporting the war effort whether they wanted to or not. And when you hear of all the other things the Germans did, I, I'm sorry, I, I've got good German friends now, but at the time, they were the enemy. It was total war, and that's it, as far as I'm concerned. You didn't think about bombing women and children when you were, you were, you were bombing the town, but of course we know there's women and children there, but I mean, if, if, the, if the powers that be said you were to bomb this, that, and whatever, well, you went. And uh, do a good job as you can, because you know if you did a good job the first time, you wouldn't be sent again. 
Time Watch has found documents which reveal how Würzburg found its way onto a target list once Germany's industrial centers were virtually all destroyed. In order to use the heavy bombers in every way possible to hasten a German collapse, new targets for area bombing were needed. On the 23rd of January 1945, Wing Commander Arthur Fawcett, intelligence officer for targeting at Bomber Command, wrote a minute with a preliminary list of potential area targets. Prior to their being assessed for any industrial or military value, the towns were first selected purely because they were easy for the bombers to find and destroy. One of the main selection criteria was that the towns had structural features that made them suitable for fire attack. The targeting authorities are trying to apply the same sort of rational logical processes to the targeting process as they've been trying to utilize all through the war. And so it's just an instinct. Let's prioritize them. Let's figure out criteria. Well, one of the criteria is that you can destroy this place. It lends itself. It's either got wood construction and narrow streets or um, other attributes that will make it vulnerable. Würzburg was vulnerable. In 1944, the British Inter-Service Topographical Department had produced this fire hazard town plan. It showed that Würzburg's medieval center was a high fire risk area. According to the legend of the plan, a high fire risk area was an area in which widespread devastation may occur from any outbreak of fire despite active firefighting. This is where the Lancasters were ordered to drop their bombs. Shortly after Bomber Command Intelligence had prepared their selection of suitable towns for fire attack, Allied air planners issued a list of secondary area targets for nights when the weather prevented bombing raids on priority targets. This target list contained many of the towns suggested by Bomber Command Intelligence. The towns were now put in the order of their military importance. But because the bombers were running out of targets, the list included Würzburg and other places which had only minor military value, but were expected to burn well. The very destructibility of a town invited its destruction. When Hitler and his cohorts um, were still notionally in power, it would have seemed odd to almost everybody who was still fighting to tell all those air forces to stand down. So those air forces were allowed to continue to do things which, it must be said in cold blood, were a moral blemish, a moral blot perhaps, on um, the conduct of the Allies. But one has to remember the mindset in which those, the, those decisions were made at a time when everybody felt a desperate urgency, let's, let's get this ghastly bloodbath over, let's finish it. Let's do everything we possibly can just to convince the Germans it's finished, there is no possible purpose in continuing to struggle. Only a few days after the Würzburg raid, on the 28th of March 1945, Churchill drafted a memorandum for the Chiefs of Staff. It seems to me that the moment has come when the question of bombing of German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror, though under other pretexts, should be reviewed. Otherwise we shall come into control of an utterly ruined land. I feel the need for more precise concentration upon military objectives, rather than mere acts of terror and wanton destruction, however impressive. When Harris was sent a copy of Churchill's message, he nearly went through the roof. He simply could not believe that Churchill, whom he had known so well and who had given him such backing, could turn round and say this about it. Sun. 
Churchill was forced to rewrite and tone down his memorandum. But after VE Day, Bomber Command had to learn that their part in the war was something many people would prefer to forget. Churchill did not mention Bomber Command in his victory speech. And whilst Fighter Command was cheered for its bravery in the Battle of Britain, Harris's request for the award of a campaign medal to his men was rejected. I think it's very sad that we didn't get a proper campaign medal um, because for two years the only way we could strike back as Germany was through Bomber Command, bombing Germany. And I think that Bomber Command on balance did quite a good job. Uh, possibly we were killing civilians as we shouldn't have done but then they killed civilians in London, Coventry, Southampton, Bristol, places like that. When at Nuremberg the Nazi leaders were put on trial for war crimes, none of them was indicted for the German bombing raids on so many places in Europe. Not even the commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering. The Nuremberg trials helped establish international standards for the conduct of war. But the difficult questions raised by strategic bombing, the powerful new method of waging war, which killed so many civilians on both sides, were not examined. <laughs> 